Well, good morning and welcome to River Church Online Worship. I'm excited to be with you today and I'm excited to continue our study, The Great Exchange, a walk through the stories of the Bible. As you know, if you've been tuning in each and every week, we've been looking at this theme, The Great Exchange, and, and we've been finding that it, it is in every uh, book, every chapter, every page of the entire Bible. It's not just in the New Testament. Now you, if you're new, might ask, well, what is this great exchange? And it is the story of the Bible, uh, how God interacts with humankind, that God takes from us our sin and he places it on Christ. And then he, in turn, gives us the righteousness of Christ. Uh, so we get a new identity because of what Christ did on the cross. We find that in 2 Corinthians 5. It says, for our sake, God made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin. On the cross, our sin nailed on the cross, placed on Jesus. He, he made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so, again, I've said that this is found in every page of the Bible, and so far uh, we have found that to be true. And at, at this point every week I tell you uh, a lighthearted story about some great exchange that I've made in life. And so I have another one this week. Um, Colt is a dog. He actually was a dog. He was, he was a Labrador retriever. Colt was the first dog that I had as an adult. I mean, I had pets as a child, but, but this was my first dog as an adult. And he was my hunting dog. Now, he, he, was, a, he was a good dog. Uh, except, except he had a, a little bit of, of wanderlust in his blood. <laughs> he liked to wander. He, he liked to wander around the neighborhood. He liked to explore the country. Uh, he liked to wander about at night when everyone else was asleep. Uh, uh, so the story goes that, that we were living in Albuquerque and, and we went on a vacation. We came down here came home to South Texas for the holidays. But for some reason, we decided to not bring Colt along. So we left Colt uh, with the neighbors. And so the neighbors were watching the dog in Albuquerque while we were way down here in South Texas. And you can guess what happened. Uh, Colt got bored and he decided to go on a little walkabout. Uh, and so when we got back to Albuquerque, our neighbors didn't have our dog, uh, but we soon found out that the Humane Society of New Mexico, they had our dog, and they would give us our dog back, uh, but there was an exchange that had to take place. I, I had to give them money, uh, and in addition, I had to pay them uh, to, uh, to uh, microchip my dog and to... Uh, neuter my dog and so exchange for the money and the services then they would give me my dog back and I expressed to them I don't want any of those things I don't want any of those things to be done to my dog I just want my dog back and they explained to me that they had all the leverage and I had no choice and so I jumped through their hoops did what they said, and then I got my dog back. And so we made this exchange. I don't know if it was a great exchange, but we made this exchange of sorts. And, and here's the point. Here's the point. Uh, the very thing that I cursed, uh, that chip that they had implanted in the back of the neck of my, my pet, my dog, the very thing that I cursed actually became a a cure, a blessing, because actually that chip, it, it allowed us to find Colt in the future when he went on uh, another uh, one of his walkabouts. Uh, and so the curse actually became the cure. Uh, the microchip uh, saved his bacon, and, and we, we got to enjoy Colt uh, for the the entirety of his life, and he, he's resting, his, his, his body's in the, in the uh, we, we buried him in our backyard just a few years ago. He was a good dog. He's a great dog. Uh, now, this, this great exchange, uh, 
that God might actually be able to take what we see as a curse and turn it into a blessing or a cure. Um, th that's something that we've, we've talked about and something that we have certainly uh, found to be true in Scripture, that, that God takes things that other people mean for evil, not that the humane society meant any evil toward me, but, but God takes things for evil and, and, and turns them on their head and, and makes them for good in, in my life. But today, today's story, we look at how an actual curse becomes the actual cure. Here's how it goes. Summary, and then we'll read it. A snake-bitten people who are dying from the venom, the poison of the snake bite, they look, they look to an image of a snake forged out of bronze on a pole. Uh, they look to that as the antidote, the antidote to the venom, the poison running through their bodies. It's the cure. Bitten by snakes, they look to a snake, and it's the cure. And so today, week eight of our, of our study, and what we are talking about today is how the curse, we're talking about both the curse and the cure. Week eight, the curse and the cure. Let's jump right in. Numbers chapter 21, still in the Old Testament, still in the, the early days of the story of the nation of Israel. They're continuing to wander in the desert, in the wilderness, the, the, the young nation of Israel, they, they don't have a homeland, they don't have traditions, they don't have a book, the Bible, to carry around, although the God is beginning to give them laws and regulations. They, they, they don't really have a history. Um, and here's how the story goes. Numbers 21. From Mount Or, they set out, set out by the way uh, to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses, saying, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, there is no water, and we loathe this worthless food. This is blasphemous. These are a people who have just, just been fed by the hand of the Lord. They, 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 they've just seen the Lord part the Red Sea and they've miraculously walked through on dry land only to see, that, see their, the, those who are chasing them drown in the same Red Sea. They, they, they've seen the Lord open up a rock and miraculously give them water when they were thirsty. They've seen the Lord miraculously deliver them from slavery in Egypt where he, where he sent down plagues on Pharaoh and, and the nation of Egypt and, and miraculously allowed uh, or caused the, the Hebrew people to escape. They have seen miracle after miracle after miracle over the last couple of years. And, and now, blasphemy. The people, they speak against the Lord. And they, and they speak against his leader. And then they speak against the gracious food, uh, the gracious gift that, that, that God had given to them the, 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 the manna from heaven that had fallen down and had sustained them and filled their bellies for so many days. They, they're blasphemous, and this is no small thing. The truth is they all deserve to be bitten by snakes and die. Continuing on, verse 6, it says, Then the Lord, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. Notice, notice the Lord sent the snakes. This is the righteous anger of the Lord. This is the wrath of God. It's the righteous anger of God towards the blasphemy of the people, that he, the very people that he rescued, the very people that he would fed and sustained and clothed. It says that their sandals didn't wear out, their, their clothes uh, weren't moth-eaten. He's miraculously carried them through the, the desert and now they blaspheme, blaspheme him. The wrath of the Lord, the, the, the poisonous snakes come into the camp. Verse 7, and the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord, and we have spoken against you. Pray 
to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And it happened. Like it had happened so many times before. If you've read the Genesis or Exodus and Leviticus and now Numbers, you see that this time and time again, Moses, he pleads on, 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 on the people's behalf and the Lord relents. And the Lord, uh, he, he takes the curse and he reverses the curse. And, uh, and in this case, he makes the snake, the curse, now the cure. See, see what I mean by that. Verse 8, and the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and he set it on a pole. And if the serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. So that's the story. It's it's a rather succinct story. Just kind of dropped right there in the book of Numbers. The the people, uh, though though they have been fed and clothed and led and protected by the Lord, they they curse his name. And they call his good gifts uh, not good gifts. And, And as a result, the Lord The Lord, in his righteous anger, in his wrath, um, he sends uh, serpents, poisonous snakes. The people are bitten. Then the people cry out for the mercy of the Lord, and and, and, and the Lord relents. Uh, he, he, He is a merciful God. He is a gracious God. In this story, he he takes the very curse of the snakes and of the snake, and he He says, lift it up on a pole, and if the people look at the snake, the serpent, they will be cured. And and that's precisely what happens. Now, notice a few things. If you're you're a close listener, you may have already picked up on these things, but notice several things. First of all, the the cure, this this, this bronze serpent on a pole that they're to look to, it's for those who have already been bitten. Uh, it does not prevent anything. It, or it does not prevent the biting. Uh, it, does not, it does not keep them from being bitten. Um, these people have already been bitten. They've, they've, already, they've already been cursed. This, the poison, uh, this, this, this death venom, it's already running through their bloodstream. And, and the clock is ticking. And the serpent on the pole is is for those already poisoned, those already dying. In other words, if the Lord doesn't do something here, without the intervention of the Lord, they're going to die. Second observation. The serpents that move into the camp and bite the people, they're from the Lord. It says that he sent them. The Bible tells us that the wrath of God is against all forms of ungodliness. The righteous anger of the Lord is poured out on our our blasphemous words and our our blasphemous ways. The Lord sends the snakes on purpose. Number three, the third observation. The, 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 The means of the cure is an actual representation of the curse itself. And the fourth observation is this. If they want to be cured, all, the way, all they have to do is simply look up. That's all they simply have to do. If they want to be cured, simply look. Look see be cured okay now obviously well, maybe this is obvious to you uh, it, obviously this is a, like a metaphor like a picture for what Jesus will ultimately do on the cross 
that Jesus will be lifted up on the cross and that, that he will uh, be the cure for the curse of sin that is running through our bloodstream. But, but, but what an odd uh, sort of, what an odd metaphor in that, 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 that we have a snake. Jesus isn't a snake. I mean, snake is always represented, you know, like the snake, the snake in the garden, like Satan himself. The snake is always represented sin and, 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 and death and rebellion and the curse itself. And Jesus isn't a snake. There's another story that the dialogue that happens in the New Testament that actually brings up this very Old Testament story of the, the serpent being lifted up on the pole. Jesus is having a dialogue with Nicodemus. You may remember this story. Nicodemus was a learned man in the nation of Israel. He was a teacher, a rabbi. In fact, it's, there's reason to believe he was the most learned and respected teacher in all the land. He was a Jewish rabbi, well-known, a man of good reputation, well-respected. And he comes to talk to Jesus about religious matters, but he's apparently a little bit concerned about his reputation because, because he comes in the dark of night. And he comes wanting to have a conversation with Jesus, and Jesus quickly takes command of this dialogue and he tells him, Nicodemus, he says, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, if you want to have eternal life, which, by the way, Nicodemus never even asked him about, but if you want to have eternal life, you must be born again. You must be born again. And Nicodemus is, is, is flustered and he says, am I to enter my mother's womb again? What does it mean to be born again? And and, 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 and as a very learned man, he, he wants to have a, an intellectual understanding of what it is that Jesus, he wants to have a peer-to-peer -peer sort of uh, conversation with Jesus. And, and Jesus expresses to him, uh, Nicodemus, it's, it's like the wind. It blows here and it blows there and, and, and you don't see it, but, but it, 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 it affects you. And, and ultimately, Jesus says to, to Nicodemus, these are spiritual matters. I am in awe, Jesus says, of the fact that you, a most re learned religious man, don't understand what I'm expressing, but, but this, is, this is a spiritual matter. And, and unless you are born again, you're not going to understand what I'm saying. And at that point, you and I probably would have walked away. We'd have been like, he's a lost case. Nicodemus, he doesn't get it. You know, he's, he's, he doesn't have spiritual eyes to see. He, he's, uh, he's a lost cause. Right? He's just dead in his sin. But, but at that point, at that point, Jesus, like the, the, the compassion meter in Jesus, it's just, it just off the charts. He, he doesn't give up on Nicodemus. He, he doesn't write him off or walk away. But where he goes actually is most curious. I mean, he could have gone to any story in the Old Testament, I suppose. He could have, there, could have, he could have talked about, I, you know, he could have said to, 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 to uh, Nicodemus, I'm the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I'm, I'm like the sacrificial lamb that you know that people, that the, the nation of Israel has been sacrificing on the, he could have got, but what he did was, ah, he, he, he compares himself, Jesus does, to a snake. You say, you sure you want to go there, Jesus? He compares himself to a snake. And he tells him the very story that, that Nicodemus would have been quite familiar with because Nicodemus was a learned religious man. John chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus says to Nicodemus, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, what's Jesus doing here? What an odd 
thing to bring up, that Jesus would refer to himself as, as a snake, because Jesus is clearly referring to himself. He, he refers to himself several times in the book of John as, as the son of man. And he says, just like Moses lifted up that snake in the wilderness, just like that, that was a picture of me, the son of man, I will be lifted up, and whoever believes in me will have eternal life. And then he goes on, one of the most compassionate phrase, or paragraphs in, in the Bible. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, lifted him up on the cross. Gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in the order that the world might be saved through him. Ah, familiar, tender words. God loved the world so much that he gave his son on the cross that we might have eternal life. So Jesus, Jesus is the snake lifted up on the pole. And you and I, again, we might say, how can it be? How could that be that the Jesus, that any of us would dare compare Jesus to a snake? He's not Satan. He's the Savior. He's the Lamb of God. He, he's the sacrificial lamb. Let's talk about him as a lamb. Why is he referred to as the snake? Well, there is this, this theme, it's the, a curse motif. There's a theme that, that is really in the Bible, several places that we, we largely miss. It, it's, it's all but, but foreign to us. But it's this theme that, that Christ was actually cursed on our behalf. That Christ was bruised that I might not have to be bruised, that he was crushed because of my sin, that he was cursed because my curse was placed on him, that he was abandoned by God, that he was forsaken by God. And that's why I cried out, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The truth is, friends, Christ became the curse. It was lifted off of me. It was placed on him. The, the Christ that was nailed to the cross became the serpent. All the wickedness and all the sin and all the blasphemy and all the brokenness, the curse that I have built up, that I rightly deserve, that I that I have amassed in my life, it was placed on Jesus on the cross, and he became the curse. Christ redeemed us from the curse by becoming the curse for us. It's said several different ways. First in Galatians 3, it says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. There it is. When Moses lifted up the snake, the very curse lifted up, and, and the people they looked, they looked at that, that's a story, that is a picture, that is a metaphor of Jesus. Jesus, you know, we tend to think he was lifted up on the cross and he had flowing hair and he was well put together and, and well dressed. And that's, of course, not the case. He was like a curse, like a, like a serpent lifted up. And, and it, was, it was an atrocious sight to see. And he did that on our behalf. He became the curse for us. Long ago. 
in compassion, God the Father determined that, 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 that this righteous anger, the wrath, the curse of our sin that we rightly deserve would be dealt with. And it would be dealt with in a, in a gruesome, grotesque sort of a way on the cross. There is nothing physically beautiful about the cross. It was a grotesque act. He, he determined that long ago out of his love for you. We, we find it in, a, in Isaiah rather 53, a, a passage that was written many years before Jesus ever even came to the earth. And, and here is the prophetic word that this is, this is what took place. This is the gruesome act that, that resulted in the, the forgiveness of our sins. Isaiah 53, it says, For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. Of Jesus, it says, He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised. He was rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Praise be to the name of Jesus. I want to wrap this up by talking about our context. 2021, your life, my life. Well, number one, if you today, in your current situation, if you're wrestling today with faith in Jesus, belief in Jesus, I want to believe, struggling to believe, what does belief even look like? What must I do to be saved? Well, I would, I would compel you today to, to simply look. Gaze upon the sacrifice of Jesus. Behold what he has done for you. Con con consider your helpless estate. Consider your sinful nature. Consider eternity. And, and simply look up. Look up. I imagine in that day, the day of Moses, that there were some who, who looked up and they looked at the serpent and they were healed because God said they would be. And I, I suppose there were some who were just so angry with God, they, they refused to look up. I mean, it, it says that anyone that just looked, just, just gazed on this serpent, this ugly serpent, if they just gazed on him, they, they would be healed and if there's nothing else left in your will today other than just the ability to just look to Jesus, just look. Just, just turn your eyes. Gaze upon the, the sacrifice of Jesus. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming for the first time, remember he said, behold, behold, look, meet up. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look, look to Jesus. Context 2021, your life, my life. Maybe you'd fall into the second category, and that is there's a loved one or a friend in your life who's wrestling today, wrestling with, with faith matters, and you want them to believe in Jesus, and you've talked and talked till you're blue in the face about Jesus and, and there's just been no no awakening no spark perhaps there's something for us to be learned from the, the example of Jesus and Nicodemus 
I would say don't help your friends, your loved ones, think more about themselves. Help them to think on Jesus, what he has done in our helpless estate, what he has done on our behalf. And don't give up. Jesus didn't give up on Nicodemus. In compassion, in love, he said, I'm here for you. I'm here to, to be the sacrificial lamb. I am. I'm here to, to, to take on your curse that you might be cured. I will be lifted up, Jesus said to Nicodemus. And if you'll believe in me, you'll find eternal life. Don't give up on your friends. Don't give up on your family. Don't give up on your loved ones. Help them to not think more on themselves, but to think more, to, to, to gaze on the truth and the beauty of Jesus' work on the cross. Amen. It's been so good to be with you today. Uh, in this age of COVID where some of you are still self-isolating, I, I just, I find it a privilege that you invite me into your home and we can worship virtually together. I look forward to the day when you're back in these these seats. Uh, many people are back. The rest of you will be back soon. I, I kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel, but for now, that's what we do, and, and I love you, and so I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that you invite me into your home every Sunday morning. Hey, now is a, an awesome time for you to go online and give. Uh, RiverChurchRGV.com is our website. You can go there and click the giving button, and and, and everything that we do here, it's, it's based on your good gifts. So I thank you for continuing to give faith, faithfully during these challenging times. Hey, maybe you have a question about River Church. You're, you're looking to get more connected. Maybe you don't have a church home, but you want a church home. Go to our website. Check it out. Everything River Church can be found there at riverchurchrgv.com. If you have a need, a uh, prayer request, you got questions, you can reach out to, to the elders, uh, us, the elders, the pastors at River Church. Uh, send me an email, personal email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, and we will help you in any way we can. We would love to pray for you, get to know you better. If, there's a, if you'd like to get connected in this age of isolation, if you'd like to get connected, even if it's through an online Bible study, uh, one of our groups that meets virtually, send us an email and, and we'll get you connected. Hey, I love you guys. You enjoy the rest of your day.